Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome again to our uh, uh, Sabbath School presentation. Uh, uh, we are taping this from the South Bay Adventist Church in Redondo Beach, California. And I hope that uh, uh, you are going to, uh, you know, uh, be able to listen to this uh, presentation. Our, our lesson this morning is uh, about Jesus as the master teacher. And uh, it's uh, lesson number five in our Sabbath school lesson, uh, quarter number four, 2020. So, uh, uh, in this uh, lesson, we are going to talk about uh, Jesus as the master teacher. Because this quarter, we are going to dealing with education. And uh, I think we need to, uh, in the introduction here, in our lesson, let me uh, present to you the... Uh, outlines of our lesson this morning. Uh, we're going to uh, delve some introduction and uh, revealing the Father Sunday. Uh, here we are going to uh, probably unpack uh, the verse in uh, Hebrews chapter 1 of uh, who Jesus is and then revealing the Father uh, again and uh, reading the Master's teacher's mind and uh, the teachers and reconciliation, and then the master teachers' first pupil, and then we are going to talk about uh, you know a summary uh, before we close. So uh, at the time of Jesus' uh, birth, humanity was in a desperate condition. The revelation, the revelation. Uh, of God in Jesus Christ would ultimately transform the whole world in significant ways. Education, uh, uh, <coughs> education and the value of human life, an honest look at history would lead most people to conclude that Jesus was the greatest teacher who ever lived. And the New Testament tells us why this is so, and that is the center of our study this week. So, uh, in our Sabbath uh, afternoon lesson, uh, we are going to deal with uh, uh, introductions. Uh, if we never knew a, a word about Jesus, uh, of Jesus' mouth, we could still spend a lifetime learning from him. Uh, the fact that he left heaven to come to this, uh, uh, to this world along with his actions while he speaks volumes. Perhaps this is why all the authors of the New Testament are thin in their quoting of Jesus' words but are instead preoccupied with who he is and the life he lived. If Jesus had not revealed the Father to us and even to the angels, we would not have known what relationship he wants us to have with him. We would have not known whether he could be trusted uh, and, and if he wants, uh, you know, to be obeyed without fear, or so, the book of Hebrews is really going to discuss this uh, in our first uh, discussion, because uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we can approach God with confidence, and in First John chapter four, uh, uh, says that we can even approach the judgment and the God of the uh, without fear. So if Jesus had not come. We would not know how to do that. So there is no way to come to the Father but through what Jesus has done. So this morning, we are going to, uh, 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 Jesus, the best teacher ever who lived, and he teaches how, how God is and who he has been seen, the Father. See, It says, he who has seen me has seen the Father, John 49. And he said the example of, he said the example of uh, <clears throat> how we should live. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So he paid the price for our sins and reconciled us with God. God, wants, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So, in details, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is the great teacher. And we should, uh, who we should worship. So, we are going to unpack 
the glory of the Father in Hebrews 1. And then we are going to deal with this example. And then uh, we are going to uh, touch basis with the reconciler and then uh, worthy of worship. So, as I said in Hebrews 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, uh, let me read uh, from the New uh, International Version, Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 1 to 4. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed ear of all things, and through whom he made the universe, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So if you notice, this is a loaded uh, text uh, the author of Hebrews uh, talk about who Jesus is. Uh, and so, let's unpack this uh, verse. Uh, in chapter 1, uh, there is no complete, uh, I mean, verse 1, says, there is no complete picture of God in the Old Testament. He spoke fragmentally, uh, fr- fragmentarily, a little here, a little there, and a small pieces. And do we have a full picture of God in the New Testament? Yes. It's easy to get lost in the rubbles. It's variously, variously, it says, to our forefathers through the prophecy at many times in various ways. In various ways. And he could have written like our fundamental belief and move on, and that would be helpful to us, isn't it? Sometimes he wished God would have done that it that way. So fragmentarily, fragmentarily, variously, God is building a record of his actions in the world and in response to human beings. Can you trust God? Check the records. It's there. It means that God invites us to deeply study deep and consistent effort to learn. Finally, the word anciently in the past means way back when the author of Hebrews wants to undermine Underline that the Old Testament is a valuable variation of God's activities. But it's not going to be clear as the New Testament. It's not going to be plain and easy to grasp. It is fragmentarily, variously, and long, long time ago that God spoke. So, in verse 2, Jesus is the master teacher of all because he was appointed by God to bring the revelation that the Old Testament does not have, to bring the explanation, the clarity on all the fragmentations of the Old Testament. But now God sent Jesus as the master teacher, as spokesperson for God, God the Father that is. He is the one sent to finally and fully reveal what God is like. He is the creator if he, made, if he made it, he can explain it. He is the best science teacher at that. He can demonstrate and interpret how it works. He can explain the very complex details of his creation. And so Jesus, therefore, the master teacher, the master scientist, the master preacher, and the master physician, etc., etc. And in verse 3, it is very clear that Jesus is fully God, as stated also in John chapter 1. Fully God in character, fully God in power, and he is the one that sustains the universe. He is not only created the world, but also fully sustains and fully make it run, you know, cohesively. He is deeply engaged in sustaining the world himself. He is also the reflection of God's glory 
as much as we can handle it. It's like the moon that reflects the sun. We cannot really look at the sun directly. Uh, the moon reflects the sun's brightness and gives us enough light to walk during the night. He is the exact imprint of the Father, meaning that He is the accurate representation of God the Father. So, uh, Paul also, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, uh, in, 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 in his discussion, uh, let me go in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verses 1 to 6. Let me read. It says, Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have ministry that do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age was blinded. The minds of the believers, uh, the minds of the unbelievers, I mean, so that they cannot see light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Paul also has the same concept as what Hebrews chapter 1 uh, does. So in verse 1, it's interesting that whenever education is involved, it, is always, it always features the light. So education really is part of cosmic conflict. There is a battle going on in the minds of people on earth mentioned in this text. Doing education, we are in the middle of that battle every day. The purpose of this lesson is to highlight in verse 5 and 6. Uh, the purpose of this lesson is to highlight the ultimate master teacher. You see in here the struggle between light and darkness, good and evil, involved in the learning process of us in this earth every day. And in verse 6 it says, The light shown through Jesus is now shown through us to give the light to revel uh, uh, the revelation of God's glory in the face of Jesus. So, if Jesus is the clearest revelation of what God is like, then proclaiming Jesus is the way to unpack the character of God to the world. But we may be, clear, we may be the clearest picture of Jesus some people would see. There are people who may not read the Bible. There are people who reject our theology about who Jesus is. Yet in the name of God, we are the clearest picture of Jesus to those people. The question is, in our character, what kind of God we reflect? So we become like God. Uh, like we become like the God we worship. The way we behave is evidence of the way how we picture God in our lives. And as people observe us, to those who claim that they believe in God, people observe us. So uh, that's how, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the lessons, the revealing the God the Father about who Jesus is. So in our slide here, the glory of the Father, Jesus said, have I been with you so long and yet you have known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? See, this is in context, Philip was doubting uh, really, of who Jesus is. He didn't believe Jesus Christ. Are you really Jesus Christ? Because he doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, fill my hands and my, you know, in the side of my, my body. And when Philip, you know, f touched the hand of Jesus Christ, and then he, 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 he blurted into, my Lord, you are the one. And Je Jesus said this uh, statement in John 14, verse 9. So uh, Hebrews chapter 1 to 3 explains that God couldn't meet human face to face after sin entered the world. Therefore, he revealed through the prophets in the Old Testament, in the olden times. And then, of course, the revelation was imperfect. Only Jesus can perfectly reveal God in verse 2. And because he is God, he was with God. And then, of course, 
uh, our, our, our lesson is this in Hebrews chapter 1. He is the brightness of His glory. Number second one, He is the express image of His person. He is, He upholds all things, meaning He upholds His creation. And He has purged our sins. And then He sits down at the right hand of God. So, in Jesus came to reach the truth about God to show us the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. So that's what our lesson is all about in the glory of God the Father. The second one is continued here. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, we already discussed this last week. Anyway, uh, the similar uh, idea is... Uh, uh, alluded in this context. And so, uh, <clears throat> in Monday's lesson, John chapter 1, 1 to 8, offers reveal a similar insight into Jesus as the passages mentioned in previous lesson. According to John, what is the result of Christ becoming a human being? What is the purpose of of his coming, and what qualification does he possess in order to accomplish that purpose? And so, uh, in our next slide, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you, and yet you have not sinned with me? And Philip, and he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, as you as the Father? Jesus revealed the glory of God and the character of the Father, yet people could see God in him. Uh, people goods. Jesus is the image of God in Hebrew 1 3, and we are transformed to the image of Jesus. As I already mentioned uh, in Romans 8, so we can reveal the glory and the character of the Father to this world. So uh, Jesus is the light of the world, John 8 12, and we have been made light. According to Jesus, you are the light of the world to light up the world with the knowledge of his character. And so this is what the meaning is, to reflect uh, the light that he has been reflecting uh, uh, as, as, you know, as the image of God. Because uh, we become who we worship. And so uh, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more time we reflect his glory, but we all with the unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from the glory of God. So, uh, uh, I have a quotation here in uh, The Ministry of Healing by Ellen White. Taking humanity upon him, Christ came to be one with humanity and at the same time to reveal our Heavenly Father to sinful human beings. He who had been in the presence of the Father from the beginning, he also was the express image of the invisible God, was alone able to reveal the character of the deity to mankind. Tender, compassionate, sympathetic, ever considerate of others, he represented the character of God and was constantly engaged in the service for, the, for God and man. So, in essence, really, uh, there is one theologian who said that the God of the New Testament is really the God of the Father. I mean, God the Father. Because Jesus revealed who, G who God is. In the Old Testament, it's talking more about Jesus Christ. But in the New Testament, Jesus revealed who the Father is. Because it is tender, compassionate, sympathetic, ever considerate of others. So there are times we... we we misjudge God, the Father, as a kind of strict. But no, Jesus, because Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And so that is really the essence of God's revelation and education. So could I ask you, do you really, do we really accept Jesus' picture of the Father? Do we really accept the testimony of Jesus about his Father? Let's be realistic and specific. In John 16, 26, 
it says that the statement about his father that Jesus said has no symbols in it. It is not a figure of speech. It is not a parable. He said, the time has come for me to tell you plainly and clearly about my father. You know the words that followed. There is no need for me to pray the father for you. For the father himself loves you. Do you accept that? Because there are times sometimes that we need Jesus Christ to bridge us to the Father. But Jesus himself said in John chapter 16 verse 26, is, you, you know the words, for there is no need for me to pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you. Do you accept really that? Do you accept in, it's that an integral part of the whole theology an understanding of the plan of salvation? Or are you still unable to accept what Jesus described as a plain, clear statement of the truth about his father? There is no need for the son to plead with the father in our behalf because the father loves us just as much as the son. So uh, that is uh, really the essence of revealing who God the father is. In our Tuesday's lesson, reading the Master's Mind, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, let me read from there. Philippians <coughs> chapter 2, verses, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. See, this is the mind of Jesus Christ. Paul said, uh, reading the Master's mind in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. So on what basis does Paul hold Jesus as an example of how to build unity in a church? <coughs> uh, so in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, it says, He who being in the very nature of God, now, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus. Paul continued, He who being in the nature of God did not consider equally with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is the name Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth, underneath, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So here, Jesus... Uh, 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 being described by Paul as humble, the mind of Jesus Christ. On what, what should it mean to humble ourselves if we are placed in a position of authority in the church? So, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, one of the most profound passages uh, in all of the Bible, it discusses the pre existence of Christ, his divinity, his incarnation. His uh, humanity, his acceptance of death on the cross. It describes the long, difficult, downward road that Jesus took from heaven to Calvary. And it describes how the Father exalts Jesus to a position of universal worship. A lot of amazing truth is packed in these verses. Paul hopes that the believers in Philippi would who could be argumentative will learn from Jesus and his incarnation. If Jesus could adapt human form, the form of a slave, 
being born in human likeness. Even submit to crucifixion, how much more should they submit to each other out of love? We are reminded that there is much to learn from the master teacher, Jesus. We learn from the message that he shares during his earthly ministry. We learn from the miracles that he performs and the way that he acts toward others. We may seek the mod- to model our own relationship with others after his great condescension and by dwelling on his willingness to exchange the glories of heaven for a manger. What a lesson that is. In contrast, the world or too often invites us to exalt ourselves, to boast our accomplishment. At a matter, at a manger, I mean, Bethlehem and from the master teachers, we learn a different lesson. That God's great work of education and salvation is accomplished by not exalting ourselves, but by humbling ourselves before God and becoming servant to others. Wow. So, uh, in our example here, he is the example, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In order to follow Jesus, he said here, we should learn about how he lived when he was here on earth. Paul masterfully described the character of Jesus and how we should imitate him in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. And so uh, here, Jesus, according to our slide, humbled himself. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, and Isaiah 66, 22. He was obedient, even the death of the cross. Matthew and Luke 22, 42, and Matthew 7, 21. He was obliging when, you know, during the, the, the last supper, he was the, the foot, the feet of the, his disciples. Uh, you know, this is a representation of being a servant in the household. He took that position to serve others. And so, uh, you know, this is one of the, uh, uh, as a master teacher, that we need to follow. Sometimes this is very difficult for us to humble ourselves. And many times we glory on our accomplishment. And sometimes, uh, you, know, you know, we do that. We focus on our own effort. And yet the, uh, Paul is suggesting that we need to follow the example of Jesus. Humble, obedient, and obliging. In our Wednesday's lesson, the Master Teacher and Reconciliation, is that God's great work for education and salvation is accomplished by not exalting ourselves, but by humbling ourselves before God, obeying Him and becoming servant to others. In our Wednesday's lesson, the Master Teachers and Reconciliation, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, 16 to 21. Let me read. Chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, no, we, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them, and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, We are therefore Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore that you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, this is loaded. 
So, if you notice, the reconciler, the reconciler is uh, that uh, says uh, that is God was in Christ reconciling uh, the world to Himself, not imputing the trespasses to them has committed the world. And verse 19 of chapter 5, Second Corinthians, sin created the breach, and between God and and humankind, we cannot close that that breach for ourselves. What is more, sin in us prevents us from truly desiring to be close to God. So God took the first step. God took the first step in here, and uh, <clears throat> He gave His Son to reconcile us with Him. He also puts the desire to repent in our hearts, and also uh, Jesus. I mean, Jesus, the Creator and Sustainer of life, and the redeem, and He redeemed us at the cross. He forgives our sins and reconciles us with God. He also makes us part of his redeeming work in our social spheres. Nowhere it does, ever, does the Bible suggest that God had to be reconciled to us. Let me repeat this. Nowhere ever does the Bible suggest that God had to be reconciled to us. Never once. But God paid the price to reconcile us to himself. Nor did Jesus die to pay some mere legal penalty. He died to reveal the truth about God and the falsif- falsity of Satan's charges. And even the angels had to learn this. And look uh, in Colossians 1.20. And through him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, not war, but making peace with the blood of his cross. As Jesus said in the next verse in John 12, 32, when I am lifted up from earth, I will draw everyone to me. Not all men, everyone, who, the whole family of the universe. You see, if you're in the, uh, in the largest sitting of the great controversy, the way in which Jesus suffered and died is the greatest revelation of the truth about God and his government that the universe will never see, will ever see, and ever need. Correctly understood, the message of the cross is final defeat of the adversary. No wonder Satan has worked so hard to obscure and misrepresent and even pervert the meaning of the cross. But to some of us, the cross is a great news. Yet it is true that sinners will die, but we have no need to be afraid of God. And he died to prove it. And his message is great power to win to repentance and the trust Paul was so proud of this good news. So, in, in Paul's writings in Colossians chapter 1, 22, the cross doesn't only represent God to humanity, but also to answer the great question to everyone, the whole universe, including the angels. Because if you notice, they were the one who was involved first in the great controversy. They have to know. And so to remove the doubt, cross answered the question. So in our Thursday's lesson, the master teaches first pupil, what did Jesus, let, let, uh, okay, this is a long statement here in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. What did Jesus' first pupil learn about him on that night when the angels sang? This text is about the birth of Jesus Christ in the manger. And how did the wise men Herod respond to the news of the birth of Jesus Christ respectively? How do pride and position often interfere with learning? And so, this morning, let, let's go into this detail. Worthy of worship. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Humanity has been encouraged to worship Jesus since 
he became man. A group of angels in the shape of the bright star came to announce the coming of the Savior, Messiah, King of Kings. And to, uh, the announcement, that announcement was heard at the hills of Bethlehem, and it was seen from Mesopotamia. So Jesus, the shepherds ran to the manger as soon as they heard the news. They understood that the newborn was Savior, so they worshipped him and shared the news. And also, the wise men from the east understood that the angel star was a fulfillment of the prophecy that foretold the coming of the Savior. They got ready to meet him, then traveled to the manger to worship him and give him presents. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So, uh, in our Friday's lesson, uh, today, uh, like, like them, like them, we are also called to worship Christ. Because being the master teacher, he was not only, uh, he was not only, uh, you know, savior, but also was a student. So in a Friday's lesson, Christian parents and teachers have high standard to reflect the character of God as revealed in the incarnation of Jesus. What should we do when we fall short of this high standard? And to summarize the whole lesson, what does this birth, life, and death of Jesus teach us about the character of God? So uh, let me give you some uh, few tidbits here before we close. Jesus being the master teacher, he was also a master student in three important ways. He was a student of himself. He was a student of God. And he was a student of people. And let me uh, quote from uh, 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 the child guidance by Ellen G. White. He was a student of himself. His education was gained from heaven appointed sources from useful work, from the study of the scriptures, from nature, and from experiences of life. God's lessons, books, full of instruction to all who bring to them the willing hand, the seeing eye, and the understanding heart. Thus, to Jesus, the significance of the word, I mean, the written word, and the works of God was unfolded as he was trying to understand the reason of things. So he was a student, a student of himself. And he was a student of God. According again in the Child Guidance, page 50, his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures shows how diligently his early years were given to the study of God's word and spread out before him was the great library of God's created works. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. So he was a student of God. And then he was a student of people. Jesus, the master teacher, understood where his students live. It does not make brilliance to be a student of people. When people talk, listen completely. The way to show respect to another person is to listen to what they have to say. It does not take a master's degree in counseling or psychology. It does not, it does take love. It does mean living outside our selfishness, which is possible when we have been, uh, when we have been of self and God. So, uh, to summarize our lesson today, education, Jesus as the master teacher, uh, <clears throat> speaking like a Christian, attending, uh, you know, like a Christian, explicating doctrines like a Christian, and calling oneself a Christian are never a replacement for actually being a Christian. There is no population that understands this difference better than our children. 
who are watching our move, you know, who are watching every move their parents do, their teacher and their religious leaders make. They may not be able to articulate it, but they are either consciously or unconsciously evaluating Adventist education based on how Adventists live. And this is the bottom line. And this is why bearing the image of God in our daily lives is non-negotiable if we want to see Adventist education succeed. So, Jesus as the master teacher, he was, we have the wondrous privilege of beholding the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1. But in Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exalt, exact representation of his nature. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Jesus came to restore the knowledge of God to humanity. Because the knowledge of God during his time was confused, was distorted. So he has to restore it. He has to reflect the Father during his time. When he said to Philip, I have been with you for so many, you know how many uh, years already and you have not seen the Father. Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So he has, God's great work of education and salvation is not accomplished by exalting ourselves, but by humbling ourselves. This is his example. We need to be humble. Humble to, to reflect his own image to other people. And lastly, for human experiences are as sweet as the wonder of reconciliation. As you know, uh, in the Bible, we are reconciled to him, not God to us. We are the one that's being reconciled to God. So, in essence, really, is that, and the last slide we have here is that, to, uh, for our sake, Jesus emptied himself of his glory. He clothed his divinity with humanity, that he might touch humanity, that his personal presence might be among us, that we might know that he was acquainted with all our trials and sympathized with our grief, that every son and daughter of Adam might understand that Jesus is the friend of sinners. Wow. So that is our lesson uh, today, and let's, let's pray. The Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity that we can do this presentation. We humbly give this honor to you, that you are our master teacher, the model in which we should live, that we will be able also to reflect who you are. Thank you, Lord, for that blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.